Aloha, friends. It's Pastor Tom Choi of the First United Methodist Church of Honolulu. You're looking at some of our beautiful church landscaping in the background. Today is going to be a different worship service than our usual one. Bishop Grant Hagia, our annual conference leader, has graciously given all CalPAC Conference United Methodist Churches, pastors, staff, and volunteers a Sabbath Sunday today, a day of rest from having to produce an online worship service. Instead of our regular worship, we will be treated to a special service led by the bishop, the district superintendents, conference staff, and other leaders. This includes our departing DS, Reverend Seiki Han. The location of the service is the First United Methodist Church of Pasadena, California. In addition, our incoming district superintendent, Reverend Moon Young Lee, is also participating in this service, so most of you will have your first opportunity to see and hear our new DS. We will have classes today as usual, but we will not be taking prayer requests today. You are welcome to leave your prayer requests in the comments section of Facebook Live, and we will pray for them at the Wednesday prayer group. We return next week with our regular service with a return of the Pancakes and Praise Band, two solos, a memorial tribute, and I will be preaching about how prophecy works in our contemporary times. I hope you will join us. And now, please join the worship service from our annual conference leaders. Mahalo nui loa, and may God bless you always. Amen. Good morning, friends. I'm Reverend John Farley, the District Superintendent for the South District. I want to thank Reverend Sandy Owine and Reverend Greg Norton for allowing us to host, for hosting us and allowing us to be here. On behalf of your bishop and your cabinet, we want to share in this time of worship. And you will notice that we're taking strict precautions. We are all masked, we are distanced, we will be using our hand gel, we will be wiping down after each person that comes up and trying to model for us all the work that we need to be doing to keep safe during this time. Our purpose here is to give the wonderful people in the local church a bit of Sabbath for all the work, magnificent creative work that has been done by texts, by musicians, by pastors, by worship leaders, and to be able to come and to be worshiping as one body, the California Pacific Conference. And so in that spirit, let us worship together. Come into this time of worship with these words as I call you to worship. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. 
Come, just as you are, to worship. Come, just as you are, before your God. Come. We are going to begin with the opening hymn of Holy, Holy, Holy. So we invite you to join us along at home, looking at the words that will be on your screen. Let us sing. A reading from Psalm 66, verses 8 through 20. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. But you brought us to a place of abundance. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice fat animals to you and an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and hear, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. This is the word of God for the people of God. In many churches at this time, we have a time with the children, and I always did that in my local church. I would look forward to that time of sitting down in the house of the Lord. But now you're sitting down in your house. So I want to just talk quickly to the kids. So get the kids in, because I want to talk about God's house, your house, and God's love. Right now, we're gathered in a big house, a church sanctuary that we call God's house. But you are gathered at home. This says home on it. So let's say this is your house. Well, this house is empty, but your house isn't empty. There's lots of people in our homes. There's lots of things in our home, and we've been kind of stuck in our homes for a while. But let's think about this. So in somebody's home, there's usually a mom or moms or aunt could be grandma in there. I don't know if you can see these too well, but this is a person. This is a person. This is a male person, so it could be uncle or dad or grandpa. They're in the house. How many people are in your house? And when people come, this says food. You've got to have food for people when they come in the house. You've got to be shopping for food, and we run out of some things. Now, there are happy boys, little happy faces. 
there. And I've got lots of kids in this house. There's a happy girl in this house. Oh, boy, more kids. Another boy in this house. This house is filling up quickly. What else have we got? Clothes. I hope you all have fresh, clean. Wait a minute. My house is getting stuffy. There we go. So this house has got, oh, how many of you have a puppy in your house? This is a puppy. And believe it or not, that's a cat. I'm not going to show it to you very long. But we have more boys and girls in this house. This house is getting stuffed. Toys. You've got to have toys in your house. That house is really full. Oh, I hope you have love in your house. Well, now the house is full, isn't it? Do you think we could get... I can't push anything more into that. But I have something that still needs to be in your house. This is a big picture of God's love. Do you think all of that could get in there? How could that happen? I hope it works. God wants to pour God's love into our homes and into our lives, even when they're full of worry about pandemic, even when they're full of worry about family members who are sick or grandparents we can't go see. God just keeps pouring into this busy, crowded place. Whoops. If you don't pour too fast, it should work that God fills all the spaces with God's love. In fact, there's more than enough room in there for all of God's love. And when you open your heart, God's love gets inside. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help your love get inside our hearts that we might love others. Amen. Acts chapter 17, 22 to 31. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the area Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walk around and look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in the temples built with the human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. He marked out their appointed a time in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his up spring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with a justice by the man he has appointed. He has a given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Here ends the epistle lesson. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that had taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear? The hour I first believed, and when we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. Sing God's praise than when we first begun. Alleluia, Alleluia, reading from John 14 verses 15 to 21. If you love me and obey the command I give you, I will ask the one who sent me to give you another advocate, a helper, to be with you always, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot accept, since the world neither sees her nor recognizes her. But you can recognize the Spirit because she remains with you and will be within you. I won't leave you orphaned. I will come back to you. A little while now, and the world will see me no more. But you'll see me because I live, and you will live as well. On that day, you'll know that I am in God, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who obey the commandments are the ones who love me, and those who love me will be loved by Abba God. I, too, will love them and will reveal myself to them. This worship service is dedicated to all of our CalPAC clergy, worship teams, and laity who've worked so hard these past eight weeks to hold alternative worships and virtual worships. We, as your appointed cabinet, are so grateful to all of you for holding the church together at this critical time. And we hope that you're not actually tuning in today because you deserve a Sabbath a time of rest so you can be rejuvenated for next week. We want to honor you and thank you for all you have done to keep the church alive during this period. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No one could have predicted the arrival of the coronavirus and its devastating effects. I think the most insidious thing about this virus, it has robbed our Christian community of that which we do best, the physical care of those who are dying and the making of meaning of their lives through our rituals of funerals 
and memorials. COVID-19 has robbed people of the care of their pastor and the church community and not allowed the surviving family to grieve properly in our faith tradition. I grieve with all of you who have lost loved ones. I pray for the recovery of those who are still battling the virus. And I feel so helpless in providing any semblance of care. But in loving tribute to those we've lost and to the surviving families, let me share the words that have comforted generations of the faithful. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. The Lord leads me beside still waters. The Lord restores my soul. The Lord leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Loving family and friends, know that you are loved by God and that we will pray for you always. This has been unprecedented times for us. It is time for us to try to figure out what is best for us in the future, make sense of what this COVID-19 has meant for us theologically. Andy Crouch has provided some deep thought on this and wonders if this pandemic will be a blizzard, which is a short passing but devastating storm, a winter, an ongoing season of deep crisis, or the beginning of a little ice age, a monumental epic that changes the very fabric of our whole civilization. I personally believe it's going to be a little bit of all three of these, especially in relationship to our church. We're going through the blizzard right now, and all of us are adapting by staying at home, trying to, to, to locate ourselves in any kind of meaning at home, but safe at home. Those who wish to open up the country too soon are counting on this being a reality, but with the outbreak still spiking, it's a false hope that it's going to go away anytime soon. It's also a deep winter, what I believe is more realistic, because it will be between 12 and 24 months before an effective vaccine can be developed, administered, created. It, it won't be soon, folks. And that's the only sure way for us to get back to what is going to be normal, whatever normal means nowadays until all of us are inoculated against the devastating effects of the virus, none of us are safe. Our churches will have to continue to innovate and experiment in caring and discipling for their communities, not just for a few months, but for a long season. It's also the start of a new age, an epic where none of us will be the same again. That epic has already started for those families who've lost loved ones to the virus. I know two people personally who have died of the virus, and they have left spouses and young children behind. Their lives will be forever altered, not for a season, but for all of their lives. In terms of the church, it has been estimated that more than 40% of our mainline churches will not make it, cease to exist in the next 30 years. What if COVID-19 accelerates that outcome? What if this happens not in the next 30 years, 
but in the next 30 months. Incidentally, those churches who will probably survive have nothing to do with size, but those are the ones who will be able to adapt and innovate. They will have a chance to make it. No one knows what the future holds, but we must be prepared for all three of these time lapses. It's often said that good leaders play chess, whereas average leaders or managers play checkers, simply reacting to the other moves rather than being two or three moves ahead. We want everybody to rise to be good leaders. And this means preparing our churches for what lies ahead. Let me give you an example. If we combine a blizzard and a season, what if our churches are allowed to open with very strong protocols, probably in phase three, which would probably not happen till summer at the earliest, or even later in the fall? Pastor Sandy has already measured her church, and as large as this church is, fitting 400 people, she estimates that it can only fit with social distancing about 100 to 125. It's a drastic change in the way things will be. So this church, it's very large, will have to adapt. They will have to find multiple times, perhaps, to which people can come. They may have to shelter their elderly or those with medical conditions to a set-apart time. The, the innovation is all over the map, but she and the staff are ready, getting ready for when that happens. There are so many other questions that we have to create. How will we do communion? How will we do baptism with social distancing? How will we disinfect this entire sanctuary after every service and make it sustainable for the church. These are just some of the things that we have to think of now in order to get ready. Combining a season and an epic, how will we manage both an online service and a service that is a limited physical one? I do not believe it's prudent to abandon the online format even after a vaccine is mass-produced and administrated. A virtual worship experience appeals to younger generations and people who will never set foot in our sanctuaries. Already, this online platform has brought together former members of churches who've moved away and not found another church in their new location. I'm hearing stories of international people from other countries tuning into our worship services. They will never have a chance to come physically. This speaks to the epic changes that we cannot abandon and which should become permanent cultural practices for all of our churches. Now, during this period of social isolation and stay-at-home orders, We've learned so much, and we've changed our lifestyles to such a degree that it has been transformational. I, for one, do not want to go back to the way it was. I believe the speed and pace of our lives to do more and more, to value things of the world, and to live these unnatural, unbalanced lives is not worth returning to. If anything, God has shown us a new way of living through this pandemic. And we can live with new eyes of faith. We have a chance for real salvation, not just individually, but communally, and globally. I was deeply struck by an article, short article from a professor by the name of Richard Gunderman, who teaches at Indiana University. He recommends one book if we are to learn about ourselves during social isolation, and that may surprise you. 
It's the second most translated book in the world, next, of course, to our Bible, which has no, no equal. The book he recommends, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, first published in 1719. Now, I have to admit, even though I know somewhat of the story, I never read the book. But I decided I needed to read it during this time, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. If you remember, Robinson Crusoe's early life had no meaning. Born to a fairly wealthy family, he shuns his father's goal to be a lawyer, and he heads to the degrading life of a sailor. He gets captured by pirates, sold into slavery, and later he's the sole survivor of a shipwreck washing ashore on a deserted island where he spends 28 years relying on his resiliency, determination, and a few of the items that he salvages from the doomed ship. Let me highlight just a few of the lessons Gunderman shares and how they apply to this time of social isolation for us. First, it's the folly of worldly goods. Our constant emphasis on money and the acquiring of things of the world. Toilet paper of all things to hoard and of which you can't even get in quantity anymore. That speaks to the folly of our secular values that we've degraded ourselves to. As Crusoe is foraging through the ship to find anything he can to survive, he comes upon a locker of money gold and silver. And he immediately realizes this will do him no good on a deserted island. What's its worth? Nothing. Whereas before this money was a drug to him, now marooned alone, he realizes of what is of value, and that is anything that can help him survive on this deserted island. As we've been marooned in our homes, We need to ask, what is truly necessary in our lives? What is more important, an abundance of money or simply food to eat? Material possessions or family and personal relationships? Status, titles, or simply good health? We need to ask ourselves these value questions, folks. Second, he learns to live simply in balance with nature. At first, the deserted island seems barren, inhospitable, threatening, and he curses his fate. But with time, the island becomes his home, and he finds that it provides everything he needs to survive. Food, shelter, protection, and even companionship in the animals he domesticates. He learns to live in harmony with the, wor- with the island, only taking that which sustains him and nothing more. He learns to live in balance with the earth. As our family has sheltered in place, we really don't need anything more than that which is to subsist. Food, shelter, and okay, a little bit of toilet paper. We talk and we interact more. Enjoy small comforts more, take more leisurely runs and walks, and marvel at beautiful sunsets. Now, the sun setting hasn't changed, but I've changed in my appreciation of small things, my appreciation of the earth and everything it holds for us. And this is why I do not want to go back to the hecticness of the way our lives were. Now, whereas a successful vaccine could be created in 18 to 24 months to enable us to get back to what it was, if we go back to the way we live post-COVID-19, there will be no vaccine for our planet. There will be nothing to save our entire reality in this earth because the global ecological crisis is for real 
And that means we all have to change our lifestyles now and into the future. And that means living like we live now, simply in harmony with our earth. Finally, the Robinson Crusoe story has a deep spiritual component. He's looking through the ship for anything, and he finds a Bible. Some reason he takes that. And it proves life-changing. He does something for the first time in his life. He reads it. In fact, he reads it three times a day. And it changes the very fabric of his being. Whereas before his earlier life was one of depravity and meaninglessness, he's forced to confront his misspent life and the guilt he bears for it. Caruso repents and dedicates his new life in honor to God who brings him life itself on the deserted island. Here's a quote from the book. One morning early, lying in my bed and filled with thoughts about danger, I found it discomposed me very much. Upon these words of scripture came into my thoughts. Call upon me, in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Upon this, rising cheerfully out of my bed, my heart was not only comforted, but I was guided and encouraged to pray earnestly, to read the first words that were presented to me when I opened the Bible. Wait on the Lord, and be of good cheer, and the Lord shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It's impossible to express the comfort this gave me. In answer, I thankfully laid down the book and was no more sad, at least on that occasion. In this time of social isolation, we have the opportunity to grow deeper spiritually and to be made new like Caruso was. I prayed and re read scripture now far more than before the pandemic hit. The scriptures themselves have taken on a deeper meaning and a more profound relevance to my life. And so it is for the lectionary passages for today. In the Acts passage, Paul is addressing the philosophers, the learned ones of Rome. He, he has this chance to engage them in debate and to evangelize them to our triune God. Now, I don't have time for a deep exegesis, but go back to this passage because it's all there. Paul shares with them an understanding of God, first which they would know, that God is in us, a pantheism that they would be familiar with. But then he reverses it to say that God is we are also in God. We are in God. Something they wouldn't understand. He says the words that we are so familiar with now. For in God we live and move and have our being. Not this vain belief that God lives in us, but that we live in God. This is what Caruso's transformation really meant, folks. His former wretched life was over, and now he understood that God had provided sustenance and health and meaning in life. And even though deserted and alone, he would live and move and have his being in God alone. How about us? If this pandemic has taught us anything, may it be that we live and move and have our being in God and God alone that there by the grace of God go I. That's what I've come to realize in this time alone and in isolation. Now, this was supposed to be a very short sermon, and I've gone way over that. But let me just point out very quickly from the John passage. It's Fred Craddock who points out that this passage has nothing to do with um, any kind of feeling when he talks about God's, when John talks about God's love. There's no feeling attached to this all. 
To quote Craddock, feelings are not commanded, but love can be. For to love is to be there for another person, to act for another's good, to do that which brings benefit to the other. This is what is available to all of us during this time of social isolation. Neighbors are reaching out and helping each other far more than ever before. I'm noticing on my runs and walks that the cars are actually stopping to let me pass, whereas before they almost would run me over every day. In our own Redondo Beach neighborhood, we have an email connection, and there's been an outpouring of people who have volunteered to do grocery shopping and errands and chores for those who cannot get outside. I had the time to respond to someone who I had no relationship, did, didn't know from Adam, and still don't to this day. She explained on the email that she had both small children and elderly parents living in the same household, and she ran out of disinfectant wipes, and she needed to keep the house clean. Anybody had some? Well, we had some, and so we took two, I took two bottles over, two boxes of disinfectants, laid it on her porch, and because of social isolation, never had contact with them physically. This is an insignificant act, I know, but it's contributing to this love that John is speaking about in Christ. I'm sure they're probably very grateful. But what was most important is how I felt. It made me feel much better in doing something for somebody that I didn't even know. What small act of love can you perform this week for somebody in need? Let me close with the way Professor Gunderman ends his article on Robinson Crusoe. A pandemic can seem like the end, but it also can serve as a beginning. We are, in a way, cut adrift. Yet a new and ultimately more fertile landfall lies ahead, at least for those of us who are not sick or broke or homeless. If we heed Defoe's inspiration, these unprecedented challenges can transform us into wiser and more caring human beings. If we add our lectionary passages for today, we can be transformed into God's children, who out of love will be there for the other, especially for those that, that Gunderman mentions, the sick, the broke, the homeless, the poor. We can be there for the other. May it be so. May it please be so. Amen. A tradition of our church is the offering. And I know you haven't been able physically to offer, do the offering because our church has been closed. So today, I ask you on this special Sunday, and if you were moved at all by this worship service, to give to your own local church. And we thank you for your dedication and your generosity.
Let us join our spirits in prayer. Great God of heaven and earth, we reach out to you with our whole being in these uncertain times. We lift up the many who have fallen ill with COVID-19 and those who have lost their lives. May your spirit of comfort and healing be upon all who are affected. We lift up to you those who are on the front lines those who risk their own lives to take care of us all. And we lift up their families who sacrifice much so that we might have health. May you protect them, guide them, and be with them in their efforts to serve. And today we lift up our clergy and laity for their relentless pursuit of you and trying to share the love of God in an ever-changing reality. Sustain our clergy and laity as they develop new ways, creative ways, to bring worship to our congregations and to the world. Grant them wisdom and insight in how to find ways, safe ways, to engage in acts of mercy and kindness, in safe ways to feed the hungry, to comfort the lonely, and to take care of the needs of our most vulnerable. For while our world has changed, those needs remain. We lift up all of our preschools and our preschool directors and our preschool families who are struggling and trying to figure out how to support our youngest disciples. In these uncertain times, when many of our foundations of life have been shaken, we give thanks to you, Lord, our rock, our redeemer, our miracle maker, for being a foundation that is never shaken, that your unfailing love and commitment to us is always present. 
So today, and in the coming days, when in uncertainty, fear, panic, isolation, and fatigue swell to overtake us, let us breathe in your spirit and firmly plant ourselves in your peace, your grace, and your very being so that we would be transformed and prepared to face whatever is to come. We pray this in your great and gracious name. Amen. As we go forth through this Easter season, let us truly be an Easter people, that in the, midst, in the midst of the pain and suffering around us, that we live, preach, and do the words and the life of Jesus to those whom we will meet. Let this be our blessing. Amen. <laughs>